Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the second of the B-side lectures. And I am pleased that it is a part of the Beaux-Arts May Day Festival, focusing on issues facing Europe today. My name is Dory Wilson, and I am the curator of the series. The title of tonight's conversation is Somebody Didn't Tell Somebody Something, The Conundrum of Colonial Monuments. Colonial monuments project a deep unknowing into the public space, laying claim to it, and in so doing, dignifying and empowering the act of colonization and the colonial project. Each monument acts as a marker to the undisclosed, multifaceted trauma that they are positioned to obscure, the weight of which we continue to reckon with today. The title of the talk is from a quote by the author Toni Morrison. At its heart is erasure, a silencing, both literal and figurative. Those left untold are the recipients of an unspeakable loss generated by the consequences of this profound unknowing. The visceral reaction affected by these objects due to their residence within the public space demands that they be considered, examined, and challenged specifically with regard to the discourse of belonging and citizenship, locally, nationally, and internationally. What do colonial monuments speak to and tell us about our society past and present? What do they signify within the public space and should they be allowed to remain there? And if not, then where? I'll be joined tonight with three panelists who I'm very excited to introduce you to. The first is Jennifer Tosh. Jennifer Tosh is a cultural historian born in Brooklyn, New York to Surinamese parents. She founded the Black Heritage Tour in Amsterdam in 2013 and the Black Heritage Tour in New York State in 2017. The tours make the hidden history visible as you explore the city's early Black presence and colonial history. In 2019, Jennifer co-founded Sites of Memory Foundation and is a member of the Mapping Slavery Project, Netherlands. She is the co-author of three guidebooks on Dutch colonial history on Amsterdam, New York, and the Netherlands. My second guest is Kayende Andrews. Kayende Andrews is professor of Black Studies in the School of Sociology at Birmingham City University in the United Kingdom. He is an academic, activist, and author whose books include Back to Black, Retelling Black Radicalism for the 21st Century, published in 2018. His first book, Resisting Racism, Race, Inequality, and the Black Supp Supplementary School Movement, was published in 2013. Kayende led leading in the development of the Black Studies degree program at Birmingham City University and is the director of the Center for Critical Social Research. He is the founder of the Harambe Organization of Black Unity and co-chair of the Black Studies Association. My final guest is Mark Rainebo. Mark Rainebo is a Belgian journalist, columnist, and historian. He was editor of the weekly Kanak from 1979 to 2003, and editor of the Weekend magazine for the newspaper De Standard, where he is currently a senior contributor. In addition to journalism, he is also an author and essayist. Mark was born in the Belgian Congo in 1956, the family returned to Belgium in 1968. He has worked for the cultural department of the city of Ghent, as well as having been a scientific advisor at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Um, and thank you for joining me and welcoming my guest tonight. Thank you. Hello, oh, Dory. And um, I'm gonna. I want to start things off by looking at the subject in a little bit of a different way, because um, 
it's sort of like what under what conditions can we dis discuss a subject like this, particularly given the power imbalance between the communities challenging uh, the presence of these objects within the public space and state power as demonstrated by local authorities, cultural institutions, institutions of high learning, et cetera. So I'm just gonna sort of put it out there for everyone to kind of put in how they see um, this power dynamic and how it, you know, assists or uh, impedes the ability to actually talk about the subject in a way that is inclusive and allows people, everyone's voice to be heard. So, um, Jennifer, you want to start with that? Well, you would start with me, wouldn't you? <laughs> Hello, everyone out there. Um, <laughs> hi, it's such an honor to be here uh, with all of you and our guest uh, online with Kayinde. Um, so thank you for inviting me to be a My part pleasure. of the conversation. Um, wow, that's a it's, a, it's a big question. I'll take it from the point of view of, of, of my focus. And in my work, I really focus on heritage and memory. So I'm very much looking at um, colonial heritage, historical memory, and how that's uh, appropriated and how that operates within society. And that includes the built heritage. So monuments are part of that uh, dis discussion. Um, and in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, of course, very much like here, the colonial memory is very well preserved in these symbols. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's always very interesting to me the way that they're, they're first, the way they're structured, they're on pedestals, you know, celebrating these uh, uh, heroes of the time when the rise of uh, not only the Dutch Empire, but European empires were congratulating themselves. Mm -hmm. And right. so, especially since last year with the, the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, and global solidarity, as you as you um, mentioned, it has brought, I think, more attention to start to rethink why we are continuing to, to hold up these um, images when many of them are, in fact, uh, responsible for great atrocities and genocide around the world in terms of waging war on indigenous people. So the question of power um, relations is always very present. Um, just walking here into the bazaar, there is at the top of the stairs, there's this uh, mural that says, please excuse the mess we are building for the future. And in the image is a colonial statue right at the front and center of that. So the future uh, <laughs> is still frozen in this, <laughs> this memory. It's like we can't get beyond it. Mm. And I don't, perhaps the, the folks that, that created it didn't even realize they did. that they're still reproducing the same kind of power dynamics. Mm. So it's so deeply embedded in, and interwoven into the fabric of these you know, colonial uh, c countries that were founded on war and colonization mm. that I think to unlock it, to, to deconstruct it, is part of, I think, what the activism that we do mm -hmm. is making people aware of that how it still operates and it still has a very visceral effect on the psyche, on the way people see themselves, on their uh, you know, nationalism and identity and giving themselves pride, but at what cost? Mm -hmm. So that is the question I'm often asking is that, you know, what is the future for the past? How do we deal with this historical memory in a way that allows us to move beyond it, to move forward? Mm -hmm. To, to add something to uh, sure. what both of you said. Um, uh, you're very right, probably one didn't realize that there was this colonial symbol in it, but that is probably the result of the fact that there are literally hundreds of references to the colonial past in the Belgian public space. Mm -hmm. I think an, an, an American scholar made a list of it. And then, for instance, there's a metro station, Pétion, it's very busy yeah. in, in Brussels, but Pétion was the last governor of, of last minister responsible for the colonies in the late 50s because before they became independent. Yeah. And he, before that, he was a civil servant involved with, with, with colonies. And this shows two things, I think, especially when we talk about Belgium, then this is the yeah. case I know uh, best of yeah. all, of course. Yeah. Um, that is, first of all, the uh, relics are everywhere and mostly on a rather subconscious level. No, nobody knows a lot about Lyon Pétion, what, what it was, but his name is pronounced every day 
millions of times by travelers on, on well, subway it's system. It's also the station for the university, too, which yes. I find really <laughs> powerful. Because I went to the VUB and I had to go to that station every morning yes. for a year. And, so. and, and secondly, I, th I think there is also the fact that, uh, for instance, uh, such a person as Pétion proves that the colonial history and everything that goes with it um, is very much interwoven with Belgian's establishment structures, with the economy, with business, with big business, mm -hmm. with politics, with um, uh, academics even. Mm -hmm. So this means that uh, there is a, 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 a link always between the colony, even since the Congo has been independent since 1960, nominally, and, and Rwanda and Burundi, which were not uh, literary colonies, but uh, mandates from the United Nations, but they became independent in 62, 1962. So that's a long time. A lot of people do not have a real connection to that, but it's still present and it's still interwoven. And uh, then I would like to, to, to add something to what you said, Dori, about the communities who are affected by this uh, in, uh, power imbalance. I think it's not only a problem for or an issue for let's say the black community, it's an issue for the Belgians in general. Absolutely. It's and and I'm an historian. I uh, I, I know a, about this history. I've uh, written a lot about it, and what you see is that in what is uh, left over in collective memory is a very distorted image, distorted mm -hmm. by nationalist uh, supremacist uh, whatever. Um, so I think it's not only a case for minorities in Belgium who are suffering from discrimination or racism or whatever, but also for every Belgian. And, and what one can see that when the uh, topic of um, statues, for instance, has had come up, and it has come up, statues and street names, yeah. uh, it has come up uh, since about 20 years yes, now. Yes, it's it's it touches all, always a soft spot. There is a lot of reaction, and even from people who are not realists, still wanting to defend King Leopold the the second, who was the founder of the Belgian colony, mm -hmm. and probably responsible on on, on a moral uh, from a moral point of view for at least some millions of deaths in in the Congo. Um, but there is some reticence that. Um, you cannot touch that, so you see identity politics working on both sides. Yes, absolutely. Kayende, what do you, what can you add to that um, uh, sort of configuration, looking at power relations and imbalances and how it affects the way in which the conversation can take place? Well, yeah, I mean, I think from both of them, I agree with everything, obviously, as well. And um, we just say, I think one of the things to recognize is the reason that if you look at the monuments and, you know, just it's so commonplace, like half the time I don't even notice and then you find something, you go, oh, wow, that, that, that was as well. It's because actually the, the truth of Europe is that Europe became great off empire. That's what made Europe, Europe. It just prior to empire, Europe was backwards. It was empire which provided the, the wealth, the resources, industrialization, etc. So that's why it's so rooted in it and why it's so also so difficult to, to shift from it because those monuments really are monuments to the things that made Europe, Europe. Racism made Europe, Europe. So we shouldn't really be surprised that it celebrates racism, right? Because that, that, is, that, is that is what it is. And I think in terms of the power imbalance, one of the things um, which is interesting about the European context, as opposed to like America, where I think these, these debates are still there, but maybe a little bit more advanced, I would imagine, is a demographic issue because, because Europe does colonialism at a distance, it means there's not that many of us here. Even now, there's not that many of us here. So um, in terms of trying to shift and trying to check, say, well, actually, the public space should be different or we should vote differently. So we just had Brexit in the UK and had Britain, well, if Britain was as diverse as America, Brexit simply doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. It's not, it's not possible, right? But because there's not that many of us, only 3% of the UK is black, then it means that we have far less power. So actually, you know, in trying to change these things, and particularly like museums, which are, I mean, one of the most elite white spaces you can find, it's just really difficult, right? Because we just don't have the numbers to do it, the influence to do it, et cetera. Um, and, and also the resources. So that power imbalance is largely economic, um, but also demographic in Europe. 
which is why I, I don't I don't know the extent to which it will really change. If you think about who the museums are catering to, it's just not us, is it? really. Like, if unfortunately, it's just not us. And so these these issues will come up occasionally, like now because it's it's in vogue. But generally, is this something that's going to be taken seriously across the board? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I'm in a similar quandary in that regard. Um, so the next thing I would like to kind of examine is a notion that um, the playwright, cultural critic, and broadcaster Bonnie Greer said to me um, last year when the Colson statue in Bristol had been knocked into the canal. Um, and that was this notion that um, in the 60s, which people always reference uh, in relation to what's the demonstrations that are happening now, but there was, uh, you know, these, these kind of visceral acts of like paint being thrown or, you know, knocking statues into the canal are political acts. But she was saying that the in her mind, the way you extend and have a kind of sustainable uh, movement is to go, you know, add on to the political acts, cultural acts. And cultural acts are, um, have, let's say, longer resonance. So I'd like to um, talk about an artist, um, uh, Rwandi's Belgian artist, her name is Laura Enzingyumba, um, and she did an installation um, in Brussels. Oh, you got that picture. Thank you so much. Um, she did an ice replica of the Leopold statue that stands behind the palace here in Brussels. And she had to fight for two years from 2016 to 2018 to uh, for the installation to be accepted as part of the Nuit Blanche here, White Nights, which is an art um, exhibition night that happens in the center of Brussels. Um, and so the interesting thing, which also goes back to what Mark was saying um, earlier, was that um, it's alleged that uh, a high level administrator within the Royal Museum of Central Africa um, disapproved of the project by stating, uh, would you like it if I wanted to melt your father? And the interesting thing is the, the intimacy uh, of, of that claim. Yeah. Like normally it's, we're being told like, that happened in the past. We don't need to talk about that, forget about it. But then, like you said, Mark, earlier about this kind of raw nerve that like sort of creeps up on people and then someone's talking about like you melting their father. I mean, it's like, wait a minute, it's an, it's an art installation. <laughs> okay. um, and so uh, I just wanted to sort of give a little bit of a description of how it was seen in the time. So. Um, in their article in, on the installation, the South African performing artist, writer, and culture worker, Kopano Maroga writes, in people, Nziumba engages with the disappearance of the colonial discourse and addresses the image of Leopold II in the public space and phantasmagorical presence in the Belgian consciousness to reify these thematics in Zingiumva inverts the statue of Leopold by suspending the podium on which the statue sits above Leopold's and the audience's head. A visual metaphor that reads for me as the unspoken, precarious and ominous legacy that hangs over all the inhabitants of Belgium. There is a palpable and embodied sense of not only danger, but of the impending weight of this foundation, the looming legacy of blood and bone that is suspended above the city of Brussels. Um, so given 
that kind of, if you can just riff with me for a moment on the content that I've just given to you. Like, so I go back to where I started, which was this idea, the power of a cultural act in contrast with a political act. Because when I look at two years of fighting for an installation and the reactions of people, she's actually done something that we're still talking about. This happened in 2018. I'm still resonating from it. People are still writing about it. And what do you, what do you, how do you see that? How do you feel about that idea? Can I say something sure. about that? I, I, I remember this um, happening. Yeah. Uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, I, I was uh, uh, struck by the resemblance. I immediately recognized the contours. This was this statue. So this is very familiar because this statue is in a very public space in the center of Brussels, mm. near the royal palace here in the city. Um, and secondly, I, I, I thought it was touching because it was so fragile, it was melting. And this, um, I mean, this gives, this was not a mere, let's say, rational discussion about a statue, but it was something very fragile, uh, vulnerable, it was disappearing, and it, it expressed some hope that with this statue disappearing by itself, just because of climate change, <laughs> in a way. Yeah, and the um, people in the room, because uh, that it, was the idea. It, it, it disappeared, so this, this was a, a very uh, a touching uh, uh, piece of work, I thought. Uh, there is no remnants of it, uh, except for, for photographs or, or mm -hmm. images that were made at the time. Um, there is still something nasty about those um, uh, relics from the past, like statues. Maybe, Kehinde, you, you remember the uh, uh, controversy uh, about 15 years ago in Liverpool, where they uh, found out that a lot of streets there were named after slave traders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And slave traders was a very uh, honorable profession because it brought a lot of money in, 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 the, uh, in the city, that is, in the 18th century. Uh, early 20th century, uh, 21st century people changed their mind. Mm. So they said, okay, let's get rid of all those uh, slave traders in our streets, literally. And uh, they found out that one of them turned out to be Penny Lane. So Penny Lane was named after Charles Penny, uh, mm. a slave trader, mm -hmm. uh, who made a fortune uh, with an inhuman, today considered to be inhuman uh, business activity. Mm. But the meaning of the name of the street, Penny Lane, had nothing to do in, 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 let's say, contemporary consciousness with slave trade, but with the song by the Beatles. Mm. Of course. And it, it is a tourist attraction. And at that time, you see that one meaning can uh, form a layer over an older meaning. And the palimpsest is a uh, historical phenomenon. So this, I, I thought, was also something very touching, like the statue that was disappearing, that was mm. the name of Charles Penny disappearing because a stronger cultural sy symbol had superimposed it. So I thought that was a good idea of the city of Liverpool then to decide not to change the name uh, mm. of Penny Lane, uh, but keep it and forget, or let's say culture won there. But uh, a, a more interesting um, question is, and, and this is, has, has been sometimes been my criticism of the um, manifestations there were last year made uh, in the um, um, Black Lives Matter uh, movement, um, when there were statues being uh, put uh, on fire, etc. That is that the discussion was, and, and you call this a political act, I say it's more an activistic act. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's, it was a bit too much about representation, I, I thought. That is, representation is necessary to start the thinking about what the meaning is, what does it represent, but there is a necessary follow-up necess uh, step to be taken, which is very much political. That is, to get rid of the remnants of colonialism in everyday life, 
which is in the first place racism. Uh, racism as such is probably not a, a relic of colonialism well, as no. such. They are the result <laughs> of the same uh, yeah, I mean, uh, phenomenon. Uh, but uh, I think... a little bit too intellectual an approach, I think, my dear. Yes. <laughs> racism and discrimination, which is very real and which is different, I think, from the United States because the discrimination and the racism, you can see uh, people representing the state, police officers, state in general, the power, killing people where, and it is filmed, S denying people a job because they are yeah, black but I, I mean, is I, I not okay. visible. That's true, <laughs> but, but Mark, we have to like, I mean, we dial getting, it back a bit yeah, because, because I think you're taking is, a bit of a, a yeah, leap this is forward. A, this is a very typical European approach to, you know, bring in the U.S. as a kind of aberrant gene pool that's different from Europe. But the racism was created here. Yes. It was sent there. So the thing is to say that American racism, I mean, racism is like a virus. I mean, it knows when it's under attack, it changes its makeup. And in this geography, it's different than the Netherlands, it's different than the Germ in Germany, in Italy, in Spain, in England. But at the end of the day, it's still racism, and we know what it looks like. We yes. know what it looks like. So to infer that the U.S. is somehow, uh, I mean, I see state-sponsored, you know, terrorism of the black body in Belgium every week. I, There's no distinction for I me. I fully agree. But what, what, what struck me that the principal victims of police, of police violence in Belgium are the... Uh, younger people in Brussels who are of North African descent. That's what you think. That's not, I don't know if that's statistically correct. Okay. I mean, Let, and we don't need to go figures. into the fine but what, detail of that. What I wanted to say is that uh, what I, I have talked a lot to activists, especially in, in the uh, black community or the African community sure. uh, in, in, in Belgium. And, and they, what I always hear is most of them are very well educated and they can't find a good job. Yeah. Why is that? Because of racism. Yeah, this, this is we know. Silent discrimination. And it's it not happens. silent. It's very loud because yes. they're not able to I mean, actually do the it thing. It doesn't happen on the street. Yeah, but that's not the only aspect. Okay. I mean, I would say, I mean, I was just saying, I mean, I hate to break it down like this, but I hate to say this, but um, Jennifer and I had lunch before earlier today, and I was telling her that for the last three weeks, I have a group of white builders who see me come out and call me a nigger when I walk out of my apartment every day. Every day. And I live in Place Fernand I don't live in an area that is considered high immigrant. Mm -hmm. So the fact that myself, half at 57 years old, have to face that that's not silent okay so can i just my yes, main point just is we have to continue <laughs> this struggle against monuments against uh, to uh, political steps and of course they have a cultural meaning in fighting racism and the discrimination that is a result of that okay structural mm, absolutely okay i'm not debating what you're saying no okay jen you want to jump in there please? i'm not sure where to start yeah. um I think going back to the question about sure. the, the symbolism of monuments, because that's what we're exactly. here to talk about. It is symbolic of the systemic and structural racism that is embedded in Europe, around the world. I mean, racism is a global system. If we have to look at it, not as my racism is worse than your racism, mm. it's all bad. Mm. And this is something very visceral in the Netherlands where, mm. where my work centers is often hearing that that, that the symbols that are so ingrained into society that, that, are, that are for a reason put on pedestals. Mm. And I, I don't know if, if you've shown uh, the image of Jan Peterson Kuhn, which is this, the, similar to the Colson <laughs> statue mm -hmm. for, 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 for the, the Dutch. Um, he is celebrated as a war hero mm. in the 17th century. He was part of the rise of empire. Oh, but could you put a picture um, up for he's that? He's glorified. And for decades, he's, oh, it's been known that he was also responsible for the genocide of the Banda 
indigenous peoples and land of in, invading the land and what is is no, so that's, that's not him that's not him um they look a lot alike <laughs> <laughs> the same period they all look alike um but but and I'm, in, interesting because in terms of his posture so this is actually the third image that i had shared that shows during the Black Lives Matter movement, you see the police force surrounding this monument, which is in the city of Horn, where mm -hmm. he is from, to protect it. Because um, many years before, uh, there's another image I think you have as well that shows the VOC genocide. So this was graffitied on the monument. Uh, this is at least, I think, eight years before mm. the, this happened last right. year. Mm -hmm. And uh, as red paint and, of course, you know, People were just enraged because mm. it symbolizes, you know, the glory of this golden age that yeah. the Dutch often love to talk about. Mm. And then in 2020, when Black Lives Matter and there was this cry for, okay, it's time to take him down, the police force came out to protect it. Yeah. So that tells your you about the your tax dollars at work. Right. That the apparatus <laughs> is so strongly in place that even with the knowledge that most people have that he is a war criminal mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes, yeah. he's still guarded as part of this nostalgia and romanticism about, you know, what does it mean to be Dutch yes. and who gets to claim that that identity. And, you, you know, if you don't belong to that national um, position, then you don't have a right to speak. Exactly. on it so yeah. it they the, so you sort of this will for forgetting yeah. about and this um, ep, um, amnesia we, we don't want to remember that because everybody's done something you know that they to be ashamed of but this is really very i think telling as you have yeah. this this image of someone standing above everything else and we choose what we're going to include in this idea of memory collective memory yeah. and what we're going to leave out exactly. and who and where the power relation really becomes apparent is who gets to speak on it now what i think is distinctively different in 2020 is you you have this global solidarity and in mass like never before you had white people yeah let's be real clear that it became sort of this really very global attention when you see the images on social media it's not just black people standing in solidarity yeah. Right. And I think that is a, a distinct difference than in many years past where it didn't get as much attention mm -hmm. because it was just people of color, you know, oh, there they go again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at the, the political politics in the whole thing mm -hmm. is how it's been framed, but also how it's been mediated yeah. through exactly. the public space. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I did say that. I think also I think that that, that taking down of the statue is both political and cultural. Like imagine that statue. The, the the empty plinth is a statement like it's a cultural statement it's gone like it was there and now it's not there anymore i have and to I say i enjoyed that very much i did i really did i, I really it. enjoyed seeing mr colson <laughs> in the canal <laughs> <laughs> and um he, um they've been trying for years and i think this is also other part of that is that's that, that something that's not being told they've been trying 18 I mean, years true. almost no yeah, it's a long it. time yeah the council had, had, had agreed to move it and then they didn't when they took long and then so people it, took, it, took it. very important point mm -hmm. because yeah, in, just like the Colson statue, many of these statues and street names, it's not just 2020. This has been for decades. People have been fighting against this colonial, you know, uh, memory, but it didn't get the global attention until something like, you know, George Floyd's uh, killing really amplified mm -hmm. all the things that had been for a very long time being addressed. Yeah. Yeah, no, and it's but, about time. And I think also, I think one of my only problem with the Colston thing is they took it out of the river because they should just have left it in the dustbin of history where it belonged. And this is what we, at some point, this is what you just need to do. Just pull the statue down. Like, imagine, um, and I've been to Brussels a couple of times. Yes. And and that, that ter I don't want to say his name, that terrible genocidal murderer. Just pull him down. It would be a better place. Just, do you, just do you realize what you're saying? He is literally everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah, if you pull him down, there'd be nothing left standing. <laughs> yeah, but then we can make some new stuff, right? I mean, we can get some young like, artists to really create something that is a reflection of what we think the world should be and what it is. <laughs> no, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, the, the problem is, is the narrative has been held captive. It's held captive. And like what you say in terms of who gets to speak, 
I would venture to say that a lot of the kind of discomfort has to do with the fact that one, they weren't built for us to be looking at because it wasn't our story they were trying to talk about. They were talking to each other. Mm -hmm. Europeans were talking to each other. And two, there was absolutely no expectation, expectation that we're people be of right African here. descent would be sitting here, <laughs> that you would be sitting talking, here talking about talking. <laughs> putting him on ice, literally putting him on ice, right? Yeah. So this is the fabulousness is that, and this is where you also have to talk about the wound, which you know, Mark, you kind of alluded to earlier, but the fact is, and this is one of the, the missing aspects of all of these discussions is that there is still a falsehood promoted that white people have not been injured by this process that there is not something that has like there is that that has impacted the way that they look at the world well this is where tony morrison's quote becomes really i think profound in that what did slavery and racism it broke the world in half it it created you know uh, bodies of owners and people who owned and 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 so it it created an, a pathology that I think we haven't really addressed that that question mm -hmm. as as to what is what I think is so powerful about the sculpture in that it melting yeah. and even though it's now gone mm -hmm. it had such an impression that it we're two years later we're still talking about it mm -hmm. well what about the statues that have been there for a hundred years exactly. we're not thinking about the impressions this is what PR and media is all about is creating impressions. Mm -hmm. You cannot walk by something like I just again coming in here. People are taking pictures. They're posing in front of the statues. They have no clue who these people really are. They just see it as a symbol of Belgianness. Mm -hmm. So let's celebrate it by saying that we were part of it, even if for five minutes. Mm -hmm. So if this one statue installation could have that impression. What we're not taking into account is this, the, in, the pathological impressions that having this standing erected over you for a hundred years will have. Yeah, now, I, I have to say yeah. one more last thing is yeah. I am not necessarily though in favor, and then this is where I get sometimes in trouble, for removing everything, mm -hmm. because then we are in danger of erasing also part of this history that we do need to recontextualize and there are some different ways we can talk about how to do that. Because in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, if we took down all the signs, all the symbols, all the gable stones, all, there would be literally nothing left to look at. So I think in a, in a sense that, the, how do we not reproduce the violence that these symbols represent, but how do we shift the gaze so that they're not centralized in the narrative or in the discussion or in the debate, that and we can start to talk about impact that that has had not only on society but on the descendants of the history that it's controlled mm -hmm. i mean that's yeah. saying a lot sorry you were going to say something <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. now know, we got something more that you can loop into that answer <laughs> yeah. yeah no because i was going to say like the, the the reality is that these statues are there for a reason they are there because these are the pioneers of europe um you know as much as they don't like leopold the wealth in Belgium came from like Leopold colonialism, etc. And the unfortunate truth is that that logic of Western imperialism, that black life doesn't matter, that's still the way the world works today. Like that is what happens. Nine million people die every year from hunger and all of them are black and brown. That's the current world we inhabit. So one of the reasons it's so difficult to deal with this problem, is it's not a problem of the past, it's actually really a problem of the present. And if we are honest, people like Leopold, or Bolston or in America, Columbus, really are the people we should be celebrating because their genocidal, enslaving, colonial <laughs> exploits are why we have what we have today. So actually to just take them down is to ignore the fact that actually, no, these are your heroes. If you, if you're, they really are, genuinely. But what does that tell us about the world we inhabit now? And that means asking a completely different set of questions, which is, well, actually, how do we make the world fairer? Because those same logics which they, they took their wealth from are the very same logics which predominate today. Yeah. Indeed. I think that's that's a very important point um, to 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 um, to put it in its structural context uh, and and how it is not just racism; it's a structure of oppression, uh, which is unfortunately still there. Uh, why is I think uh, vaccination 
with COVID in Africa is about 2%, I saw a percentage, uh, and uh, the UK can boast it is, I don't know, 50%, and, and Europe that it is 40%. There is a reason for that. That's not um, a, a, a coincidence. And mm. maybe uh, I've been wondering a, a lot myself what to do with the remnants and, and the symbols that tried to tell us something. This person is a magnificent person because he did something to our nation. How do we deal with that? And, and there was something interesting. I saw this famous statue of Leopold II for a few years. A, a Brussels artist has been covering it from time to time with red paint, yeah. symbolizing blood. Mm -hmm. um, even more, uh, maybe subtle, is a big statue of King Leopold in Austin at the sea. Mm -hmm. And it represents, so there are all kinds of figures around it, uh, the yeah. grateful uh, people, uh, mm -hmm. because he brought, uh, I don't know, uh, wealth and, and all that to, to Belgium. And there are also two uh, little black kids, or three, yes. I don't know. And uh, this has been contested for a long time. It's a very huge monument. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, and uh, a group in, of activists, in, in um, leftist activists, mm -hmm. uh, have cut off the hand of one of the boys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A reminder of this atrocity that was mm -hmm. to a certain the degree commonplace yeah. in the Congo to cut off the hands of, uh, of, of children and also uh, yeah, of everybody. Ups, uh, <laughs> to intimidate uh, mm -hmm. and, and to, uh, to make oppression visible. Mm -hmm. That was, in fact, the reason. So, what you had is that you had something very tangible a child with a missing hand and i thought this was a good idea to treat this this monument mm -hmm. because you add something to it by taking something away mm -hmm. and to show what the effect is of what the narrative is of what this monument tried to tell us that was beneficial well the kid lost its hand mm -hmm. and that, and that immediately shifted the gaze from the monument's intention to now everyone's talking about the handless child. Yes. And that's precisely what I mean by mm -hmm. how do we recontextualize these narratives? Uh, to change the narrative, yeah. and, and something is very subtle, so something they don't have to do, it's some amateurs with a little soul that, yeah. that could do this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, of course, it took, I think, three weeks before anyone noticed that this was done at night illegally, mm -hmm. uh, that something was changed, but nevertheless, uh, the hand is still officially disappeared. Uh, I know who it has. Well, everybody knows who it has. But uh, mm. uh, there, there was also police trying to to mm. find out who did this. Investigation. Of course, and, mean, and to restore like the image. The... Yeah, that was the intention. <laughs> yeah, but but to, what you, what you have here is this historical monument that everybody knows. That there is something that has altered and. I think this must, this is a questioning of the image, but also of its meaning. And, and what can this learn, uh, or, or how can it alter the, the view? And also the almost uh, hypnotizing effect that of, of such a, a monument. It, it says something very uh, um, comprehensive without we really noticing what uh, then you yeah. see an image of harmony, etc. And then, yes, mm -hmm. there is a distortion this distorts the image. So I think this is an interesting thing of dealing with such a monument, which is better, I think, than just putting a plaque next to it, but yes, this man was a mass murderer. This is, I think, too much uh, or, or, or too, too... Just uh, another uh, idea that was that's kind of similar to this in uh, using the same statue of, of Jan Peterson Kuhn. One of my uh, colleagues, um, Raoul Balai, who's a visual artist, mm -hmm had, I thought, a brilliant idea of, instead of removing the statue of Kuhn, why not add a, more statues surrounding him of the resistance fighters who fought against his, the invasion that he made? So mm -hmm. take him off this, so that changes, shifts also the dynamics of his image as mm -hmm. the singular hero, you know, untouchable. And now you have these, you know, these warriors from the Banta 
mm. who fought against them. So, it, mm. so the narrative always runs that he killed everybody and there was no, no, no resistance. Left. No one left no to one report left. on it. Yeah. No, no one fought against him. Mm. He was uncontested. Well, that's mm. just not true. Yeah, well, so if you, if you talk to the, the, the descendants from Indonesia, they have a very different narrative about how they fought against, uh, against his invasion. So oh. the, I thought it was a very clever idea of putting additional statues surrounding him with people, you know, people in their war um, uniforms who actually did fight. And in the reason that he attacked the Bandanese people was because the first voyage that he made, 80, 80 of the Dutch soldiers were, were, were executed by the chief saying, get the F out of our country. <laughs> they Indonesia. don't ever tell that part of the story. <laughs> That they did. No. They that they started the war. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when they showed up on the shores trying to you know monopolize the spice yeah. trade. Yeah. So there's always two sides to the story, mm. but we all then usually just only get one. Yeah. Uh, can it, can you talk a little bit about like the the follow up to or the impact of the Bristol uh, of the Colson statue? Because from what I understand now, there's a lot of activity around um creating um well there's legal ramifications for people engaging in this kind of activity in future is that correct oh yeah no certainly and in terms something of something that's going to be a kind of national sweep around uh you know sort of monuments nationally within the the united kingdom that they will that this law has an impact but also that the people of Bristol have also been protesting quite strongly against it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, one of the things that generally happened in the UK after the last summer is the government has had this major backlash against the idea of Black Lives Matter. Um, there's, there's no racism. We don't need to change the schools. It's not really that big a problem. We just had a, uh, a report, a so-called report into racism in the UK that said the UK, the only there's no institutional racism is actually a beacon of progress for the rest of the world, which I mean, you know, yeah, I'll make you up. Pretty very terrifying. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, the Britain's definitely a beacon for the world on racism, but it's the opposite. It was just the Dutch that were the beacons. No. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and, everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but the, um, but on, the, on the issue of protest in particular, mm. so they've, they've brought this, this bill that's going through Parliament currently, I mean, it's horrendous. I mean, it basically it basically criminalizes protest. If you're too loud, you can be put into prison and fined. Um, if you deface a statue, the the actual um, it's ten years in prison for defacing a statue. So that's wow. that's higher than for rape. Like literally, like defacing a statue is now will be when this law comes into to pass and it will come to pass will be higher. Will be worse than committing rape, right? So oh, there really has been this. Let's let's the government. This government in particular got into power on this culture wars. We want to defend Britishness, keep Britain white, immigration policy, et cetera. And has really doubled down on that very heavily. And that's why you'll see in this protect the police, protect statues. Um, it's just, it, it's, it's actually, I'd actually say in the UK that it's worse. It's worse now than it was last summer, mm -hmm. definitely. If you actually yeah. look at what the government's response has been. It's really sealing. Yeah. Yes, if I remember well, there was also a letter sent by the government to the museums in Great Britain that yes. if they might reconsider their collections and what they ex what they put on display and what not, that it would be frowned upon or something like that, mm. which yeah. meant, of course, that it would cost them subsidies uh, uh, one way or another. So yes. this, this means that the, let's say, the curator of a museum, which is some someone who deals with with the content cannot judge his own collections anymore because of the threat of government that they would not like that no yes yeah, the, the government really has um in terms of i'm, I'm forgetting the name of the museum it's a, it's a major museum it's a, it's a british museum. it's a major museum in the uk anyway they've uh, replaced i think it's a british museum because <laughs> they british moved museum. the statue of the founder of the museum and then wrote a whole um sort of text contextualizing him like mm. because he had the i can't his name starts with an s can Soames or Soames. Yeah. he he was had a very prominent space and they moved him out of that prominent space and into a cabinet yeah. and then wrote a letter and and following this action was when this conversation around well you know be careful because your funding, because the British Museum gets huge gov uh, federal funding. Oh yeah, yeah completely. And even the, government, one of the biggest ones. Oh, certainly. And they're even involved in people 
in people on boards and making sure there's people who defend statues on boards and stuff. I mean, they really they've made a lot of effort in this in this area. Like the culture war thing is a is a massive thing for in the, the government is particularly embedded in it at the minute. And really they're staking their claim on defending Britishness, which basically means whiteness. Um yeah. quite in quite a sinister way. No, indeed. Um I'm gonna ask a bit of a a question that's a bit spiky, but I will ask it. Um, so is the current discussion surrounding colonial monuments a first world problem? Or is it indicative of a long overdue reckoning with the legacies of colonialism and slavery and their effect on racialized communities in the global north as well as the global south? So I'm thinking about, you know, this lifestyle that we have in the global north is facilitated by children in congo mining rare earth materials yeah. Yeah. for the electric car batteries and the iphones yeah I so mean, you know it's like are, is this a luxury question we're talking about i mean personally i because i know you do this work kind of i mean I'm much more preoccupied with the uh, well-being and mental health of young black children in school. Like this yeah. is terrifying to me, the way that the life, even in, I mean, in 2021, I'm hearing stories about young black children being friendless and, and, and it's because uh, people don't want to touch them because they're black. Yeah. I mean, I, this is really worrying. So. I know. I mean, it's, it's 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 a yes and no answer. So in some ways it is. So the British Museum, I don't go to the British Museum. I couldn't care less. Honestly, I do, I'm not going to go in there. I don't. I don't get stuff for me. <laughs> so I'm not that interested. But mm -hmm. um, and but also if you actually think about where I was, I was in Belgium, I was having this conversation with Belgian activists. Uh, we took us on a tour around the many, 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 many uh, <laughs> live <Monuments>, right? <laughs> And um, they were having this debate, though, in Congo. So remember, they, they have these monuments in the on the developed world. Yes, it's not exactly. just here. They have them in the colonies. The roads must fall starts in South Africa because they have them in South Africa. So this is a conversation which is sparked. Actually, in, it, it, it matters, and it definitely matters more in the former colonies about this as well. Um, but yeah, I do think there is a danger where you just talk about statues and, you know, mm -hmm. it's important, but is it the most important? But I do think the statues are important because they do represent that physical space that what we're celebrating is indicative of what is celebrated by society. So it's indicative of the other things, but we have to make sure we're addressing the other things as well. I mean, you could take down all the statues, put up, you, could, you could just have black people statues the whole of Europe. It isn't really gonna change the actual condition that black people live in Europe. So you have to make sure you combine the, the things together. I mean. But why do you think it's so difficult for this space to be shared? I mean, this is also one of the things that's very troubling to me. It's like, yeah, okay, so, you know, it's like the, the suggestions you made, Jennifer. I mean, why is it that it's like there's no space that can be used? I mean, in the Netherlands, you have a, a, a memorial to, um, you know, uh, people that suffered, you know, were, were enslaved, and you have Ketikoti, and so, but here in Belgium, you don't have anything like that, but there has, and maybe it's because the conversation happened in some, some parts of the conversation happened in the 70s, 60s and 70s, but there in Belgium, it seems absolutely impossible to take any space from, you know, there has not been one street renamed in Belgium for anybody of color. There's not, I mean, this whole Place Lumumba thing was a total fiasco because it was taken over by the political sort of voices and, and repackaged. And now we've got this kind of weird triangle of, of stone that everyone walks around because it's in front of the metro station and nobody can even find it. So, I mean, what, I mean, I'll ask, you know, particularly Mark, I mean, I want you to kind of chime in on this, but also, uh, Jennifer, because you're you you both I mean, obviously you're here in Belgium, but you're also in a in a place where just the idea is anathema. Like it's just too far for people to go. 
Well, actually, I, I, I wouldn't say that because I think that there are lots of interventions happening throughout Europe. There are, I think, where activism has had a really strong impact. Of course, it seems like activism just started last year, but we tend to no, forget no, that it's yeah. been going on Absolutely. for generations. Mm. And I'll use the Netherlands, since that's where, where I'm based. There is a very strong movement that, again, is intergenerational movement and the claiming of space. Mm -hmm. So non-governmental organizations like the Black Archives, mm -hmm. sure. the Black Heritage Tour has been you know, operating even before the Black Heritage Tours. Mm -hmm. There were similar tours in Utrecht, in other cities, and now we formed a very strong network mm -hmm. of, the, of course, organizations. And I think um, now museums are catching on mm -hmm. because people like, um, of course, I, my Believe bad that? memory, in the UK at the British Museum Black History Studies Group. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why their names are escaping me at the moment, but mm -hmm. they've been doing uh, decolonial tours mm -hmm. in the museum mm -hmm. to focus on the, the Egyptian, African heritage mm -hmm. and presence. Mm -hmm. I've been doing museum tours at the Rijksmuseum, the Maritime Museum, focused on the black presence, mm -hmm. even if the black presence is subjugated as enslaved symbols, mm. not always. Mm. And that these interventions and these, I think, infiltrating these public spaces, we're not asking for permission to do that. Mm -hmm. We're doing it. Now, five, six years later, the institutions are catching on and saying, okay, maybe it's time for us to reflect, repatriate art and et cetera, et cetera. That's an mm -hmm. ongoing discussion. Sure. So I do think it is happening. It may not reach the level of international news because of course they only yeah, want to focus the on the murderers. Aspect, think, yeah. But there is, I, I, want to say, I want to give some hope that it is possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you've done, Kayende, you know, in, in Birmingham University, I think is, has yeah. that resonated around the world. In the no, Netherlands, we also have, you know, activists who are academics who are trying to disrupt the system in, in functioning the way it's always functioned, even if it's just to make people more aware yes. that this is what's happening. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I think it's, it's a very difficult question um, uh, in, in Belgium because you have a lot of competing cultural struggles going on. Uh, at the same time, yeah. and <laughs> often it's uh, difficult to find a place on the agenda. Uh, for instance, <laughs> me, me personally, I've been fighting against street names uh, dedicated to a Nazi. Mm -hmm. there, there are still f uh, three or four, well, there is one person who has all the street names mm. um, by some kind of mechanism that's too complicated to mm. uh, describe here, but mm -hmm. a Nazi, mm -hmm. a collaborator, but he still has three streets in 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 uh, in Belgium, and and when I asked the mayor why don't you change that to a Nazi, uh, he said, well, yes, but the people that who live in that street have to change their address, and that's difficult, and their mail <laughs> might not. I mean, this is what, what you, this is you can't even get a Nazi oh street name changed. We're in real trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, World War II so, is a memory that is sacred in Europe, and you can't is, touch that. This so. Is a, a personal struggle for me for the last 15 years. There were six when I started. There are so still you're at least three making left. progress. It, it's, it's not my personal um, uh, doing, but uh, the only <laughs> thing I do is write people. from time to time in the sure. paper. Yeah. The same story, by sure. the way. He's a Nazi. And then people are writing letters to the news. People, are you sure he's a Nazi? But he was <laughs> a poet sure? and then this and that. We <laughs> have the receipts. Uh, yeah, okay. so you have to understand the circumstances <laughs> of the time. Um, so, now we have this other matter coming up, yeah. but also there is... So basically you're saying the Belgians can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Like, well, you know, there's too many, if there's too many things on the table, I, then... I think it's complicated uh, because, uh, for instance, there's talk about a Flemish museum in the north of, of Belgium. Uh, yeah. uh, there is a, a Flemish cultural identity being promoted by the government. Yeah, and that's so this Im that's one of the reasons why this Nazi cannot disappear because he was also a Flemish nationalist. Okay. And 
Um, so if you have then another story coming in, another narrative, because it's a constructed nationalist narrative that right. is not based on fact, but on some kind of magic thinking. Mm. So you cannot involve something else. And I think what is also a fact is that the African community in Belgium is rather small and it is only the last decades yes that's that right especially young people well-educated people that's right uh claim the voice that's right you did not hear them uh as such and there was a good reason for that because the belgian authorities defended immigration and it was only students etc yeah. so a very limited group that could could come and in colonial times nobody could come as exactly. unless there was a very exceptional reason for that right uh, and this made this makes a difference from for instance the uk yeah um, or, or france yeah and um so this idea uh, that there is something wrong uh, in our conception of of the world and mm -hmm. uh it's a first world problem, of course, because it is in the first world that it is situated, yeah. uh, but not in a metaphorical sense, of no, course. I understand. But it is linked to the, the other uh, situation that you have this inequality and discrimination on a large, on, on a worldwide scale. Right. And nobody cares, or right. not really cares. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, you can see that in, 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 uh, on, on a lot of, of levels. But especially this, this um, also uh, this this lack of attention for the issue of our memory of, of, of colonialism, what we think about that, what we know about that, mm. also went uh, in pair with the fact that historiography was very underdeveloped until the late uh, 20th century. The last 20 la last 20 years this has changed uh, for the better, but it was sometimes a bit let's say, uh, uh, revolutionary to, mm. to discuss about another history mm. of, uh, of the Congo. Uh, th the most influential books on uh, Belgian colonialism have been written by Americans, Ho Child, yeah. Yeah. and in 1960 by uh, Neil Axerson mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, about, about Leopold. So, but foreigners and anthropologists and sociologists but no historians have written about it. <laughs> okay. And yeah. this is also a reason why this awareness is very dissipated, yes. not very structured, not, and this is, there is, uh, let's say, it's, it's getting better with um, Yeah, but it's a bit time. foggy, to yes. say the yeah. least, yeah. So it, it's foggy, it's mixed with other discussions, right. it's never been promoted by activists. Yeah. Um, so that is why this consciousness is rather poor in, in Belgium, mm. and. Mm. Uh, I, I was I was not surprised. For instance, the, the first um, when when uh, the, the first proposals were there to change the names that were named after Leopold II, mm. nobody suggested to have Lumumba's name for it instead. Well, <laughs> it, it was uh, another That's local politician yeah. that they wanted to to have. Of course. And then you hear I, I remember this discussion about uh, the plus Lumumba. Yeah. But yes, Lumumba was a communist. Yeah. Uh, even uh, uh, Nelson <laughs> Worse Mandela, than a, a few years <laughs> ago, Nelson Mandela was, was mentioned, but he has been on a list of international terrorists. Yeah, that was but the, I mean, uh, that's the kind yes, of uh, so process, though, that, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I completely get your point that at the in the end, because of the kind of vague notion of how these things are like put together in Belgium, that it's almost like if you go if you go into other areas, you're taking space from things that yes. we've decided it's are disputed are primary. areas. I mean, and I think. Also, yeah. yeah. So I just think to add to that, if you think about it, the problem is not as Europe really is heritage generally is yeah. is it, it's just white, right? Like the imagination is mm -hmm. things which happened in the past were white, mm -hmm. and immigrants are new, so therefore it's mm -hmm. not heritage, right. and there is this complete disconnection that what happened in Congo was Belgium, what happened in mm -hmm. Jamaica was Britain. So when they conceptually when they think heritage, they just think it's white, 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 white. Just and the, we're new. We're not we're not we're new. We're not we just yeah. got here, right? right. And that, that's one of the big differences of the states where because you have black people in the states from the start, you I can't do that, right? Whereas right. in Europe exactly. really like to pretend that, that, that we didn't exist. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 But, but it's also yeah. a kind of false narrative because you know Africans have been in Europe since the 13th, 14th century in various 
on, yeah, yeah. you know, but even when we were in the stuff. colonies, we were in Europe, so, we were in we were in Britain, like, yeah. the empire so, was, I mean, was part that's of here. Also, well, the part that's I, not I being told. I think that's a major point, and that is why your uh, rebels rebels around the statue were not even considered. What what you see also in geography, in in uh, in history, I mean, um, Africans have no agency. They don't speak. They don't move. Yeah, well, they don't act. Not uh, in this. Not instance, in that frame. There were, um, uh, strikes in, in, in 1940, 41 in, in, in the Congo, very major strikes against the war effort. This was never reported. Yeah. You never hear the voice of, or something, for, except for something folkloristic, mm. folkloristic yeah. but the voice of a political thinker. And yeah. that is why Alamumba is right? Yeah, but that's also communist. what I talked and about so in terms, of, at the beginning, about erasure and silencing. I mean, ultimately, the notion that somebody didn't tell somebody something means that the implication of that is there's a, a level of erasure and silencing because you don't tell because you want certain things to remain unknown. I just want to ask, because we're going to creep into the Q&A soon, um, but I just want to ask a kind of, so we can get a better idea or get a better sense of, of who you all are and, and your work and how having this discussion, like how it, how it orientates your work or how you look at your work. So what are you trying to accomplish in your work generally? What is your incentive and what is your motivation? It, essentially, what, what made you make the choices you've made over time in terms of the work that you do? So um, for me, my incentive was I couldn't find it. It didn't exist. I mean, it was obviously it was some level it was there, but it wasn't tangible. Mm -hmm. And so I had always been taught if it doesn't exist, then you create it. So again, infiltrating a space where, where we at, uh, had minimal or no access. And it wasn't as if, you know, um, people just said, yeah, that's great, do that. <laughs> Because I came from the United States to study abroad, I came as a student, an international student. My family for three, four generations have been in the Netherlands. I have Dutch heritage. I claim that identity just as much as anyone else, given my family's history in Suriname, in uh, the US, Africa, et cetera. So I felt like I had the trifecta of you know, identity, that I could declare this. And so the inspiration for me was that to raise people awareness, first starting with my family, because when I started talking about, you know, we're, we're being erased out of Dutch history. You know, I'm in, I'm taking courses in, in colonial history and sociology, anthropology, et cetera, and it's only about this idea of the glory of the so-called golden age. The Dutch love to celebrate the 17th century as the rise, uh, the rise of the Dutch Empire, and I'm like, how can you talk about being one of the ten richest countries in the world? and not talk about war on indigenous people or invasion of indigenous lands or slavery and slave, et cetera. It just felt so incomplete. Like, this doesn't even make any sense. And of course, as a descendant of the history, I kept asking the questions, why aren't we including? So that's what inspired me to go deeper and to create a community or to develop my own community of like-minded uh, scholars and you know intellectuals, activists, et cetera. So that was, for me, the inspiration and my I think the focus of my work really now is about producing knowledge of being part of a community which is why I'm so impressed also with uh, Kaind if I could just have this one-on-one -on -one, I'd be like okay how did you do that how did you <laughs> break through the institution to, to, to develop this because that to me is what has to shift is the production of knowledge from the global south it needs to have that needs to be our purpose, mm -hmm. right? We, we cannot rely on historiography to do justice. We have to demand it for ourselves. So producing knowledge or being a part of the, the community and the institutions and the networks that are interested in engaging in those debates, it doesn't mean that we're all gonna be, you know, kumbaya, kissing and hugging and talking about, it's gonna be a fight. Yeah. Because it's we're talking work. about power. It's hard we're work. talking about dismantling structures of power. Mm -hmm. No, Who's going to give up that easily? Mm -hmm. I get asked that all the time. So if we do all these things, then what's going to happen to to my Dutchness? I mean, that's a, a valid question that people are afraid of. Mm -hmm. And they're basically saying, well, 
I like being white yeah. and privileged. Yeah. How? What do I do now? But your Dutch, your Dutchness <laughs> is the vapor. You're putting I that mean, into that's in the threat, thing. right? So people feel genuinely threatened that they're going to lose something in the transfer of power or sharing power. Yes. But that's also the framework framing of the narrative. And I'm okay with the struggle. Like, I'm glad when people actually are honest enough to say that's what they're afraid of because that's what it is. So for me, the inspiration is I do still change. I'm a part of the change. I've been invited, or sometimes I just take a space, and then they see I'm not going away. And they say, well, we might as well go, go with her because she's already there. <laughs> You know, and, and maybe that's also my generation where, you know, we, yes. we come out of that generation where we're like, well, we take the space. We're not yet asking permission. Mm -hmm. And if you want to join, fine. If you don't, we'll see you when I see you. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's really about knowledge and the transfer of knowledge and using non-traditional Eurocentric ways of transferring that, that generational knowledge that, that we have been told does is not valid. Yeah and reclaiming that. So yeah. it's a lot of it is personal for me because mm -hmm. I'm also on this search for my own, you know, legacy and history. Um, so I'm very inspired by so much of the work that's happening uh, mm -hmm. in, in my network and mm -hmm. beyond. So yeah, yeah. that's it. my story. I'm sticking with <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> my, my story is full of ambivalences, um, but that's OK. Mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, of course, I have an anecdotal uh, personal uh, connection with with colonialism because Absolutely. I was born in Africa because of colonialism, mm -hmm. and my parents and their surrounding they called themselves colonialen, so mm. there was no uh, yeah. not colonialists but colonials, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and yeah. this was a very common. Y'all could put a shine on just about uh, anything, right? Uh, let's say there was no stigma or whatever. There was I'm proud of that. There was no. There no, was no nothing. Yeah, it was a like way of determining who they were. They were yeah. colonial. Yeah. Um, and they spoke a bit of the local language, uh, uh, Swahili, in, in, in my case. So I, I spent my, my childhood there, but then, of course, because of of, of, of studying, I I came back to to Belgium. So my parents came back, and I came with. They took me with them. Um, but this is anecdotal, uh, something in, in my background, which changed my character probably a bit, but not because it was Africa, but because I was a foreigner when I came here. Mm -hmm. Although I was only, in fact, uh, 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 12 years old. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I think I do not consider myself to be an activist in, 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 the, um, in this meaning that in this case, there are no good people on both sides. I mean, there is, <laughs> um, <laughs> there is one. I hate to say the word, but it's one truth, um, mm -hmm. and it, this is what I stand for. And and there is no alternative truth. There is a fact <laughs> right, and no alternative for that. fact. So uh, the fact that the guy after who the, the streets are named is a, a Nazi is a fact. Though you cannot discuss that and. <laughs> You should not accept that morally. And so I, th I think that that is why I, I kept being interested in the colony, because then I became a, 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 a student of history, and I, I found any practically nothing about uh, Belgian colonialism that was not for a, a freshman in, in historiography. You could easily v view the um, colonialist propaganda. Mm. There, there is a here in Brussels, uh, uh, an academy now it's called for uh, Sciences d'Outre-mer, overseas, uh, <laughs> yeah, overseas sciences, but yeah. it was uh, mm -hmm. colonial uh, sciences. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in 1973, they, they published very academic books. In uh, 1973, the Secretaire Permanent, the, the permanent secretary who was in charge of everyday business, wrote uh, um, an introduction to one of their yearbooks stating how wonderful the genius of Leopold II was. So I, my idea then was, then I could read already and understand what was going on. How can this institution, which is devoted to sciences about Africa in this case, how can it write this kind of propaganda nonsense? 
uh, propaganda lies, 1973, mm. that's uh, almost a decade and a half after independence. Um, so Pierre Stanner, I can almost <laughs> say it by heart mm. what, what, what he wrote. Mm. Um, so I think that as an historian, and then as certainly my uh, work as a journalist, I have to write about this, how it really is, not what the propaganda says. And when things come up like anniversaries, uh, apologies, mm -hmm. uh, monuments, mm -hmm. street names, I have to take a stand, but I do not consider it to be to take a stand. I have to write about it and how it is. Mm -hmm. And I try to do my research mm -hmm. uh, and speak to people about it. But there is, yes, there is this sense of vulnerability that uh, white people will lose power. They already lost black feet, but they cannot uh, <laughs> uh, give it up. And, and now they are going to lose this colonial heritage. Um, yeah, well. And I understand, I, I can understand why they think like that. Yeah, uh, but that's I an don't error. have to agree with that. No, I don't have to a, agree with their know, argument. If you believe not, in truth, then you certainly can't stand behind that. Yes, and then on a more general level, I think that every kind of injustice must be fought. You cannot, mm. um, for instance, tolerate discrimination of women, of um, homosexuals. Uh, why you cannot accept the principle of discrimination? If mm. you allow it for one group, then it will ex extend to other groups. Mm. And mm. so you have to fight this all this at the same time. No, and indeed. it's not really, let's say, uh, you call it a fight from your, let's say, existential point of view, from mm. my existential point of view. I'm an old white male. Um, I was going to ask you, did you know that, that you were <laughs> I'm an old white male, So I'm glad you, you positioned uh, yourself whatever. in the conversation. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> and I think that this is what a, a, a decent human being should do, is yeah. stand for equality, but also economic equality, yeah. and fiscal equality, exactly. and, and, and social rights, and Absolutely. the right of Africa to be vaccinated, yeah. and, uh, even if it's in our own interest. Indeed, but so I'm sorry, I one... have to give Kayende the last yeah. word <laughs> um, So before we go to the Q&A, because we, we need to um, have I, a conversation yeah. about that. I don't really have a good answer, because people ask me this question, I don't know, like, what else would you, what else would I be doing? And I think that's the important part of, yeah. of education because I was lucky enough to grow up in British Black Power. Both my parents um, activists worked, like worked, I volunteered in the Mark, uh, Harriet Tubman bookshop when I was younger or was made to volunteer in the bookshop. Mm -hmm. So I just grew up understanding this country for what it is, <laughs> luckily, unlike a lot of people, right? And when you have that's that right. education, mm -hmm. what else would I, I don't know? Like if you understand how the world is and where white supremacy dominates, I don't know what else I would be doing other than this. And I guess you struggle where you are, and I happen to be in a place where the education system so bad, you know, and yeah. we just need to, it just, yeah, so I don't know, I don't really have a good answer, it's just, once you understand how things are, I don't think you have much of a choice but to struggle, and be struggling the other way you can, and I'm struggling the best way that I know at the, at the minute, I guess. Um, it's a question for Kayende. Um How can universities stop playing lip service or per performative activism we're seeing a lot of woolly statements, but no transformative change. Uh, you're probably asking the wrong person. I mean, that, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I work in a university, we have black studies, and you would think I'm probably more positive, but honestly, like, it's been hard. Like, it's constant. It's a struggle right now. Like, if, yeah. I would be surprised if I resign in the next, like, two months. Like, that's how bad it is all oh, wow. the time. Like, so the uni hasn't ever really supported it. They've just gone along with it because why well, hey, why not right but actually mm. to do it it's been it's, it's really really complicated complicated mm. like, it's really difficult because actually and this is why i always say to people that we're not decolonizing university isn't something which we're doing certainly and i'm not sure it's possible mm -hmm. if you think about what the university is i mean it just is racism embodied like the, the knowledge the way it works the way it functions europe's work and i've, I've been to i've been into europe a, a number of times recently and it's worse than it is in the like it's worse. No, so I'm it saying bad in the UK. No is question. Awfully, it's awful in Europe. And so what we've essentially done is essentially we basically colonized the university where we've been able to carve out a space where we is the knowledge is different, the teaching is different, the relationship to the community is different, the research is different. 
But believe me, to do that has been extraordinarily difficult. And I'm not, I, and I don't think you could replicate it, if I'm honest. So, yeah. and, uh, and even in my, this is in my unit, you're supposed to be positive, but mm. we see the same thing, Black Lives Matter statements, nonsense. It's just nonsense. So, I don't know. I don't know, I'm trying to be more, <laughs> trying to be more positive. But I, okay, let me, try, let me answer that positively. If, if it were going to, so we, I spent most of my time trying to get the university to do things. And you know we've been successful to some extent, but not all the way successful. But I think the key things that you the union would have to do is really so yeah, yeah, yeah the positive answer. Me the positive. So in a positive answer in this space that we've created, this colonized, the space that we've colonized in the university, number one thing we changed was the relationship to the community, and not just in a let's go do some outreach with people. Actually, genuinely, organically, the community is part of the course. Like it just is. They feel part of it. We oh. do things together in terms of the audience so when we write stuff and, and we're not writing it for the white academia we're writing it for the community when i say community broadly that's not just local but national international so it's a completely different kind of conversation we're having with the work when we're doing research is research which is benefits the community so we have you know we, we have an organization around the organization of black unity and we work closely with that we've basically taken resources from the union and put it into the directly into the community and so, yeah, if the uni would replicate this on a bigger scale, certainly. But then you get into all the problems with fees and everything else and neoliberalism. It's getting worse in many ways. But I think there are things you can learn from the space that we have. And the question is, if, if, if universities are serious, what they would do is say, well, let's take those things and let's, let's make that what we do as standard. I'm just, I'm just going to tell you right now, they're not going to do it. But if they, if, <laughs> if they wanted to, that is what they would do. But we can do blue sky thinking, right? Exactly. <laughs> right. Anybody else want to jump in on that question? I mean, Jennifer, you talked about knowledge production. Yeah, and I, I'm sure you do a fair amount of interaction with universities. Absolutely. Um, the, you know, the funny thing is I, I started a master's program at the University of Amsterdam mm -hmm. in the heritage and memory studies. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I first applied um, of course, given the interest that I had in, in uh, you know, black heritage and history, and they were very candid and said, you know, we think that you would be a great applicant, but our focus is on World War II heritage and memory. So there wasn't even, you know, the consideration that, that any other memory beyond World War II or the Golden Age could could have so you could do golden age of world war ii but nothing not, else. not there was no <laughs> space in between i mean world war ii for the for the dutch his you know in terms of history is like a sacred history it is it is it is revered as right. something that's untouchable <laughs> and it's the, it's a shame, and the golden it's age quite ironic refer that to formerly golden age as the 17th century and i used to ask people do you think people that lived in the 17th century said i live in the golden age no, <laughs> they didn't know nothing so about these it. So ideas are all constructed, oh, yeah. and in some ways, and it's, a, and a, it's a, hindsight. And it's so, a, a when you start to, to really think about that, um, you know, what I really applaud, though, uh, for my colleagues that are that are doing the work, mm. is deciding it doesn't exist. We're going to create it, even if it's in a non-traditional institutions. So, if it can't be in the university of Amsterdam or you know the main uh, you know, major university like that well there are other institutions that are embracing new knowledge production from the global south yeah. and so the black archives is a perfect yeah. example of mm -hmm. you know these are interesting because in the media the black archives is referred to as street historians oh my god now the, the the founders of the black archives between them have four master's degrees yeah. But they're street historians. <laughs> because of the location where they are. Well, the, not just location, but because, but who's, the, because who's they're running it. They're, they're, descent, they're, right. they're black people yeah. in an, an all black institution that was founded 100 years ago, our Suriname. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it can't be considered, you know, academic it's like folk folkloric street historians yeah. i was so in I'm like, what does that even mean so, it's but cold it, but that's, we know what the code but, is but that's the point that yeah. we we are often marginalized yeah. not just because of and the knowledge is uh, exactly but that devalued. knowledge production in and of itself cannot be academic if it does not exist within these you know constructs which is why i think the, the way the media framed what you did uh, at Birmingham kind of was, was he started the black studies and the end of the story, racism is dead. I mean, you know, <laughs> it, gets, it gets swept away 
and then no, nothing else happens afterwards. No one hears about the reality of what it, it takes to actually yeah. maintain that kind of thing. And I think the other thing that for me is, is about systemic change happens not from just beating against the door. You mm. have to go inside the system. Mm. You have to infiltrate these spaces. Mm. Um, um, the new political party uh, by Ain in the Netherlands, yes, it's, it's you know, it's Sylvana Simons, is tearing shit up, yeah. excuse me, <laughs> but just by her, her sheer presence yes, that's in true. this predominantly white space, mm. questioning the, the structures of power and making them answer her. Mm. She is now able to systemically, if not change the system, but at least confront it. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a power base behind her that are just right there waiting. Don't mess with her because she is representing a large body of people. Mm. Maybe it's less than 10 percent of society, mm. but that 10 percent still has power. And we mm. have to look at ourselves as that we're not just, you know, powerless, no. that we do have the ability to affect change. And there is a movement happening and it's not going to stop. Yeah. And a lot of, you know, the difficulty around having these conversations not only about colonialism but about slavery is that you know it's it's always couched in this notion that i mean mark you mentioned it early earlier that there were there was um black people had no agency but from the moment the chains were put on people were rebelling mm -hmm. from the moment and young people and and get swept up in this whole the way in which history and 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 heritage and, and so on is presented uh the primacy of you know the foregrounding of slavery but but completely ignoring the the rebellions and the and the and the pushback i mm -hmm. mean never ending is part of the reason why it's difficult to engage young people around this kind of history they because see themselves it, in it well it's yeah. also yeah. that you know it just happened to us they're not yeah. understanding that there were, from the moment people understood that they were going someplace that they would never return to, they were fighting. Yeah. And that's a human thing. And this is yeah. the other thing. It's like, you know, there's this notion that, you know, the people of African descent are the most illegible humans on the planet. And we are not. Yeah. It's, actually, it's actually a metaphor I use a lot for being a professor, actually, uh, that comes from slave resistance which is if you think about the role of the slave pastor, like the purpose of the pastor was to ma pacify the masses. That's where you go around, preach this kind of white Christianity that's going to keep you docile. And that really is the purpose of professors. Like, honestly, like, that's, not, that's the role that I embody. But it's also not coincidental that um, so many of the slave rebellions were led by pastors because they were the people who were allowed to read. They were allowed to talk to big groups. They were allowed to go around the different plantations and they used that privilege to have rebellions. And this is how we should see ourselves in any of these institutions where we have this privilege, is the purpose of us being there is to maintain racism. But it doesn't mean we can't subvert that. And that's what we're basically trying to do with Black Studies, right? To use that privilege to, to create rebellion. And that, that's, that's what we should be trying to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've got one last question. How do you see the evolution of our fight in the future? uh like in two centuries well kind of you wrote a a book talking about that right back um, to black yeah i mean it depends it de basically it depends because I, I did write back to black and i just sub subsequently just wrote the new age of empire which is a, almost a prequel which kind of lays okay. out the scale of the problem and then back to black is, is the solution but okay. it's a decision that we have to make there is the few it honestly depends if if we carry on on the path that we are on it's going to be terrible. Believe me, it's going to be terrible. Because mm. and but now why the book was called Back to Black is because you know, in the sixties, Malcolm X is my absolute favorite person. Um, and you know when he's talking about revolution, that's the real possibility across the world: Pan-Africanism, communism. You know, it's not certain we're going to end up here. Mm. And what happened was we got independence in the Caribbean and Africa. We got racial relations legislation. We got civil rights. We got a black president. We got we kind of started to convince ourselves we could reform this. And if we keep believing that, it's going to get worse and then worse and worse and worse. But if we go back to that kind of revolutionary zeal and understand that this system can no more provide freedom, justice, and equality for Black people than a chicken can lay a duck egg, to quote Malcolm, 
then we'll realize this, we just need to do other things. And if once we decide yeah. that, then we can do it. And that's always been the key. So it's kind of up to us um, if we're going to recognize the scale of the change that we need. Brilliant. Okay. Well, unfortunately, um, we have run out of time, but it has been an absolute joy and pleasure to <clears throat> to speak with the three of you. It's it's more than I can really say. I mean, it's been incredibly refreshing. I've learned a lot and just really joyful. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, just want to make some basic housekeeping. The the next uh, B side lecture will be uh, during Afropolitan Festival, which has been rescheduled for the weekend of the 9th to the 11th of July. Um, and our event, which is called Heart and Soul, focusing on um, well-being and healing from racial trauma with the psychologist Gilen Kuniani will be on July 11th at 5.30 in the evening. So more information will go out in, in the next uh, weeks about that, but um, check out the website to find out more, both about Afropolitan Festival, but also the event. I just wanted to close with a statement um, in terms of how I see uh, these colonial monuments in the space uh, in, in a more broader environment. Um, so this has been a conversation on colonial monuments, but what it's really about is access and the consideration as full humans. People of African descent have been the sources of wealth creation in the global north via the vagaries of slavery and colonialism and we must be honest about this. The lifestyle enjoyed in the global north is built on the backs of millions of people of color across the globe. It is now time to write a new chapter, which includes the histories and contributions of people of color within these national narratives. We are not interlopers. We have been here from the very beginning and we will remain until the bitter end. So I wanna thank my panelists, Professor Kayende Andrews from Birmingham City University. Thank you very much. You. Mark Rainabo from De Standard, historian and journalist. And Jennifer Tosh, founder of the Black Heritage Tour and, sorry, <laughs> cultural historian based in Amsterdam, Netherlands. So thanks again. Have a great evening and a wonderful Ascension holiday. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks again. Thank Bye. you. Bye.